This is Space Time, Series 24, Episode 85. Coming up on Space Time, an Australian interstellar laser propulsion system. The biggest comet ever seen becomes active. And the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, becomes the first billionaire to fly into space. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Scientists with the Australian National University have designed a new laser-powered propulsion system as part of the ambitious Breakthrough Starshot project to send a fleet of light sail spacecraft to explore the worlds of Alpha Centauri, our nearest neighbouring star system. The giant laser is designed to accelerate ultralightweight spacecraft to unprecedented speeds, allowing them to travel their 4.3 light years to Alpha Centauri within two decades. Breakthrough Starshot is one of the Breakthrough Initiative's suite of scientific and technological programs founded by Russian philanthropist and physicist Yuri Milner to search for signs of life across the universe. Other initiatives include Breakthrough Listen, the largest ever astronomical search for signs of intelligent life beyond Earth, and Breakthrough Watch, a global astronomical program aiming to identify and characterize planets around nearby stars. The design concepts behind the ANU's laser propulsion system to launch probes from Earth to Alpha Centauri have been described in the Journal of the Optical Society of America B. The sheer scale and size of interstellar distances between star systems is difficult to comprehend. Travel from Earth to Alpha Centauri using today's conventional chemical rocket-powered spacecraft would take more than 100 lifetimes. The study's lead author, Dr. Chathura Bandatunga from the Australian National University, says the light to power the sail will come from the Earth's surface, a giant laser array with millions of lasers acting in concert to illuminate the sails and push them on their interstellar journey. Once on their way, the sail craft will fly through the vacuum of space for 20 years before finally reaching their destination. During their flyby of Alpha Centauri, they'll record images and undertake scientific measurements, which will be broadcast back to Earth. Of course, the message will take 4.3 years to reach here. The ANU team has expertise in different areas of optics spanning astronomy, gravitational wave instrumentation, fiber optic sensors, and optical phased arrays. The founding scientist who pioneered the ANU note of the project, Dr. Robert Ward, says an important part of the grand vision is the development of the laser array itself, designing a system which will have all the lasers acting as one. The total amount of optical power needed will be around 100 gigawatts, and that will require around 100 million individual lasers. One of the other scientists involved in the study, Paul Sibley, says determining how to measure each laser's drift will be an important part of the project. The current plan calls for the use of random digital signals to scramble the measurements from each laser, then unscramble each one separately in digital signal processing. This will allow engineers to pick out only the measurements needed from a vast jumble of information. They can then break the problem down into smaller arrays and link them together in sections. To orchestrate the whole show, the ANU design calls for a beacon satellite, a guide laser placed in Earth orbit, which acts as the conductor, bringing the entire laser array together. Professor Michael Ireland says the design of this laser engine requires compensation for the distortion and turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Unless corrected for atmospheric distortion, the outgoing laser beam would be diverted from its intended destination. Island says the ANU proposal uses a laser guide star, sort of like adaptive optics. In this case, it'll be a small satellite with a laser which illuminates the array from Earth orbit. As the laser guide star light passes through the atmosphere on the way down to Earth, it measures the changes in the atmosphere due to turbulence and different temperature layers. Banditunga says the next step will involve testing some of the basic building blocks in a controlled laboratory setting. The idea behind the Breakthrough Starship initiative is to have a solar sail or a light sail, I should say, that's propelled from a ground-based laser array. So this laser array will provide the propulsion for this light sail and it accelerates up to a fraction of the speed of light and hopefully explore 
interstellar bodies, our target is Alpha Centauri and the stars and planets surrounding it. This all started when it was discovered there was a planet orbiting the habitable zone around Proxima Centauri. Uh, yes, Proxima B was the was the planet that was uh, discovered there, and that's one of our main goals is to see if we can explore that system and hopefully get a glimpse of what it looks like up close. And it's not just a single probe that's being launched. The, the, these are going to be small micro probes, and there are going to be lots of them. Yeah, that's right. In order to get the the speed, the probe needs to be really small and really light. It's going to be a small dot on the sail, you can imagine, and we can launch one of these at a time, but then we can launch a, over a couple of days, we can launch one every few days or so. One at a time, but we'll have a string of them heading out towards the Alpha Centauri system. Explain the principles of light sails. You're not relying on the solar wind as such, the, the stream of charged particles from the sun. You're relying more on the momentum of photons. That's right. Anything with energy will have a momentum that it carries with it. We're using the momentum of these photons to push our light sail along. Now, you could do the same thing with light from a star, a sun, for example, but you need a lot of it, and that's where our laser array comes into effect. So by having a laser array that's so large and able to coordinate its beam onto the light sail, we're able to maximize that effect, get enough light on it in order to get the speed that we need. It doesn't keep propelling it all the way along. It just gives it the push it needs to get it going. That's right. We have an illumination time, which is what I like to call it, of 10 minutes, and that will take it from where it starts off, which will be in an Earth orbit, a high Earth orbit, but it will provide that initial kick to get it up to speed and cruising on its way to Alpha Centauri. By the end of that 10-minute window, it'll be on Mars approach. So that gives a scale of how quickly it will be moving by the end of uh, this momentum transfer. Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's pretty incredible when you think about it. Yeah, it's... Uh, it, the scope of it, it, it really takes me by surprise even now. 20 years to get to the Alpha Centauri system. You're focusing, I take it, just on the propulsion side of things. You, you don't know what the probes themselves will be will be designed to do, what they'll be capable of doing? Uh, that's right. Our specialty, uh, we have a pretty diverse team here, but our specialty is really on the laser system and how to coordinate all the lasers and make sure that they phase up and impart maximum photon pressure on the light sail. There are other teams that are working on the two challenges that you talked about, the probes, the sail. There's also the challenge of getting communications back from Alpha Centauri once we do reach our destination. Uh, so these are all challenges that are being worked on by different teams uh, around the globe. Yeah, that's the other point, isn't it? Unlike Star Trek, we don't have subspace to talk through, so we have to wait four years for, well, eight years for a conversation to take place. That's right, and it's an interesting question to figure out how the best way to package that information so that we get as much of it as we can back here on Earth is. Have you heard anything from Yuri Milner himself? Has he said anything about the, the work you guys are doing? Uh, I I've heard that he's pretty excited, but uh, not from him personally. No. <laughs> Tell me about the research that you guys are doing in general that lets you place yourself in a position to explore the possibility of developing this propulsion system. Sure. So we have a technique that was developed over the past decade or so at the Australian National University, which is called digital interferometry. And what this allows us to do is make a really precise measurements of how the lasers are behaving. But on top of that, it allows us to identify lots of these measurements, even when they're put together. And so the problem we face with such a large laser array is that there's so many measurements that we need to make. We need to make them in a way that, that we can understand and we can pick out the ones that we need at any given time. And so that's where this technique becomes really powerful in allowing us to select out individual measurements and then combine them to get what we want. The ANU is doing a lot of work with lasers right now. There's the uh, work being done with adaptive optics. There's the work being done to target and eventually slow down and maybe even encourage the re-entry of space junk. It seems to be a, a growing field. Yes, there's a lot of exciting work here at the Australian National University on laser development and specifically optical phased arrays. So this is the laser array architecture that we're leveraged to build our platform on. So as you've mentioned, there's work on uh, space junk and space debris tracking and maneuvering, adaptive optics and the, the lasers required for guide stars. And then we're taking that to a, a larger scale for the Breakthrough Starshot project. In order to 
achieve the sort of propulsion figures you're talking about, it must be a, a, a heck of a big sail. The material of the sail needs to be extremely robust and needs to not absorb too much of the light, otherwise it will not survive. But it's not actually that big. It's only a couple of metres across is the current design specification. So even from its initial launch point, it will be like hitting a pin from about 100 kilometres away. That challenge will only get harder and harder as it accelerates away from the Earth. So at what altitude will you be releasing these spacecraft and aiming for the initial boost from the laser? So at the moment, where we plan for a 200,000 kilometre orbit, so that's That'll be the launch altitude, and it'll expose or illuminate the sail from there for about 10 minutes as it passes overhead. The other thing is guidance. How do you guide something like this? So that really depends on the final spacecraft design. My current thinking, and uh, this is subject to change, is that there won't be any additional correction once or any meaningful additional correction once the sail is in motion. So really, it's the shot towards Alpha Centauri, but we do have multiple shots that we can take. So as we talked about before, we can send multiple probes, one every few days, and so we have a bit of redundancy in that respect. The Alpha Centauri system is visible in the Southern Hemisphere. Yes, the location for the laser array is yet to be determined, but there's a couple of things that we need to take into account. One of them is being in the Southern Hemisphere, but also we need to look for places where the atmosphere is not too turbulent. Um, so probably is, South America then, the Andes. Yes, uh, that's one of our candidates at this stage, still subject to change as the project evolves. What about the Earth's atmosphere itself? Will you be using a lot of adaptive optics technology to correct for that? So the atmospheric correction is a challenging problem because the array is so large. We have to do adaptive optics on something that's a kilometer in scale or several kilometers in scale. So the way that we've gone about integrating adaptive optics into our system is to use a second satellite, uh, one that will not be launched, but is in a similar orbit to that of the sail. It will have a laser on it, and it will shine back towards the array, illuminating the array. And the light from that satellite will therefore pass through the atmosphere and give us a measurement of the atmosphere and how it's changing in real time. We can then use that to pre-distort our outgoing lasers so that they recorrect and as they pass through the atmosphere and focus onto the sail. Who needs sodium in the atmosphere then? <laughs> That's right. Why not just send a satellite up? Okay, so suppose this gets up and running. What's next? So as far as Breakthrough Starshot is concerned, uh, what's next for us is to test out some of these ideas in a controlled laboratory setting. So the two ideas we want to test out is how to make these links between small arrays so we can make a bigger laser array, and then also testing out the atmospheric correction idea that we, I talked about it previously. That's Dr. Chathura Banditunga from the Australian National University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, the biggest comet ever seen becomes active and NASA's Hubble Space Telescope back online. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Astronomers have discovered the biggest comet ever seen. The comet named C-2014 UN271 Bernardi Nelly Bernstein, after its two discoverers, is more than 100 kilometres wide. It was found by reprocessing four years of data from the Dark Energy Survey, which used the 4-metre Blanco telescope at the Cerro Tolulu Inter-American Observatory in Chile between 2013 and 2019. When first imaged, the comet was some 4.3 billion kilometres from the Sun. That's almost as far out as the orbit of Neptune. Although initial observations found no activity on the comet, follow-up studies by the Las Cambras Observatory have found the huge comet, which is inbound from the cold outer reaches of the solar system, is showing it now has a coma and it's become active, although it's still twice as far from the Sun as the orbit of Saturn. This comet is so huge, it's more than three times the size of the next biggest comet nucleus known. That's the comet Hale-Bopp, discovered in 1995. However, unlike Hale-Bopp, which turned out to be spectacular, this object's not expected to become a naked-eye comet. That's because it's on an extremely elongated orbit, journeying inwards from the distant Oort cloud over millions of years. 
and its orbit takes it from far above to far below the ecliptic, the plane about which the planets in our solar system orbit the Sun. In fact, Comet C-2014 UN271 orbits almost perpendicular to the plane. Reaching perihelion in January 2031, it'll be swooping around the Sun still far beyond the distance of Saturn's orbit. This is space time. Still to come, NASA's Hubble Space Telescope finally back online. And Boeing's Starliner CST-100 readies for its second test flight. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Hubble Space Telescope is back in service following marathon efforts to fix a computer crash that shut the orbiting observatory down back on June the 13th. The telescope's delicate science instruments were put in safe mode when the glitch occurred, shutting down all non-essential systems. Mission managers eventually traced the problem to a power regulator in the power control unit, which is designed to ensure a steady voltage supply to the payload computer's command unit science data formatter, which sends and formats commands and data. Technicians at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, were forced to practice a complicated procedure needed to switch to the onboard backup computer. See, the problem is switching to the backup system meant several other hardware systems on the orbiting observatory also needed to be switched over, due to the way they're all connected up to the Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit. Finally, on July the 15th, they performed the switch for real, and we're pleased to say it all went smoothly, with all systems coming back online just as expected. New science observations are already underway, and mission managers are working hard to reschedule observations lost during the shutdown. Of course, none of this is really new. Technicians were forced to perform a similar switch back in 2008. That allowed Hubble to continue normal science operations after another command unit science data formatter module failed. The fifth and final Hubble servicing mission aboard the Space Shuttle Atlantis on STS-125 back in 2009 then replaced the entire Science Instrument Command and Data Handling Unit, including the faulty Command Unit Science Data Formatter module with the unit currently in use. Since that mission, Hubble was able to perform over 600,000 additional observations, bringing its total to more than 1.5 million during its lifetime. The 11,110kg Space Telescope was launched in 1990 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery on mission STS-31. It was placed into a 541km high geocentric low Earth orbit. Hubble's design is based on a National Reconnaissance Office Keyhole Spy Satellite that equipped to point its 2.4m telescope outwards into the cosmos rather than down onto the Earth. Its observations have changed humanity's understanding of the universe, studying distant planets and stars, and seeing galaxies and quasars up to 13.4 billion light-years away. This is space-time. Still to come, Starliner ready for launch, and the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, becomes the first billionaire to fly in space. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA and Boeing are hoping for better luck second time round as they prepare for another launch of the CST-100 Starliner spacecraft on what will be its second test flight. The reusable spacecraft has now been secured on top of its United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket in preparation for the launch from the Cape Canaveral Space Force Base in Florida on July 30th. Starliner's first test flight back in December 2019 failed with computer problems. Firstly, the mission clock triggered an orbital insertion burn at the wrong time, placing the spacecraft into an orbit too low to reach the International Space Station as intended. And then while they were trying to work out what to do next, mission managers found more computer programming issues. These ones so severe, had they not been corrected in time, they would have caused the spacecraft's crew capsule to collide with its service module during the re-entry phase of the mission, and that would have resulted in the capsule being destroyed. The new test flight, slated for this Friday, will carry 200 kilograms of cargo and crew supplies to the space station, autonomously docking with the orbiting outpost, undocking autonomously, 
and returning to Earth, eventually landing under parachutes on the White Sands Missile Range in the New Mexico desert. Now, if the second test flight is successful, NASA will attempt a manned mission, tentatively scheduled for sometime towards the end of the year. And if that all works out smoothly, Starliner will join SpaceX's Dragon, transferring crews to and from the space station sometime next year. This is Space Time. Still to come, the world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, becomes the first billionaire to fly in space. And later in the science report, a new study has confirmed that taking just a single dose of the Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccine is less effective against the Delta strain of COVID-19, underlying the need for that second shot. All that and more still to come on Space Time. The world's richest man, Jeff Bezos, has become the first billionaire in space. Bezos, whose company Blue Origin is developing a fleet of spacecraft to meet different needs, was on the first passenger-carrying flight of the company's new Shepard rocket and capsule designed to carry tourists to the edge of space. The 11-minute flight takes space tourists on a ballistic suborbital trajectory to an altitude of over 100 kilometres, the official start of space. The flight took off from Blue Origin's Van Horn launch pad in Texas, reaching an eventual apogee of 351,210 feet. That's 107 kilometres above the Earth's surface. The flawless mission was the 16th test flight for New Shepard, timed to coincide with the anniversary of the first manned lunar landing by the crew of Apollo 11. New Shepard is named after Alan Shepard, the first American in space. Blue Origin's also developing a heavy lift rocket called New Glenn. That's named in honour of John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth. Joining Bezos for his flight was his brother Mark, as well as 82-year-old Mary Wally Funk, who trained as a NASA astronaut during the Mercury days of the 1960s, but wasn't allowed to go into space because NASA didn't allow women to fly into space back then. She's now the oldest person to fly in space. The fourth member of the team was 18-year-old Oliver Damon from the Netherlands. He was given the ride by his dad, who paid $28 million for the ticket. The ticket had been originally auctioned off for charity, but the person who paid the top dollar for the ticket was eventually forced to decline the journey because of other commitments. And so Oliver's dad, who offered the second highest price of the auction, wound up winning the historic seat. And like a good dad, he gave it to his son. Oliver's now the youngest person ever to fly in space. Of course, rich space tourists are nothing new. Dennis Tito was the first back in 2001, paying some $20 million back then to ride aboard a Russian Soyuz spacecraft to the International Space Station for a week. Looking at today's prices, that was a bargain. And there have been several space tourists since then, one of them even travelling twice. Unlike Richard Branson's flight nine days earlier aboard Virgin Galactic's Unity rocket plane, which was dropped from a jet-powered mothership and glided to a runway landing after reaching an aperture altitude of 86 kilometres, New Shepard uses a conventional rocket flight path, launching vertically with 2 minutes and 20 seconds of powered flight from its liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen BE3 engine, reaching a speed of more than 3,700 kilometres per hour and an altitude of over 188,000 feet before Miko. The passenger-carrying capsule then separates from the booster and continues climbing under its own momentum to an apogee altitude of well over 100 kilometres, the official start of space. The capsule then descends using parachutes and soft touchdown thrusters to provide a smooth landing, while the booster descends separately, undertaking a powered vertical landing. The bridge is retracting. We are in auto sequence. Ariane, when that engine gimbal check occurs and that engine swings, they should actually be able to feel it uh, in the cabin because it'll sway the stack back and forth. There go the aft fin checks. The engine gimbal check just peeking out at the base of the rocket. All right, here we go, everybody. Thousands of people contributed years to this historic moment. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for Blue Origin's first human flight. Godspeed, first crew of New Shepard. Let's light this candle. T-minus 16, guidance internal. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4. Command engine start. 2, 1. We have lift off. New Shepard cleared the sound. <laughs> and New Shepard has cleared 
Boston Tower on our way to space with our first human crew. Oh my goodness, listen to the roar of the BE3 engine. We are just about to pass through Max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Those when the stresses on the vehicle are at their maximum. Max Q. Max Q is confirmed. Beautiful burn on that BE3 engine. Liquid, liquid hydrogen. Mach 1. And uh, liquid oxygen as the propellant. It's a nice, not just clean in terms of uh, beautifully performing, but what comes out of it, it's steam, right? To see the, the glow of the, of the engine underneath the rocket just under our shoulders and to know that we've got a crew that is going to space. It just feels different, doesn't it, Gary? It is totally different. <laughs> so far appears to be a nominal flight. All right, coming up here on Miko, main engine cutoff. That will be followed shortly by separation. And at that point, after separation, we're gonna uh, let the, the astronauts unbuckle and take in the freedoms of zero G. There is Miko, main engine cutoff, awaiting separation here. Stand by, you're gonna see the separation of the capsule from the booster itself. And there we go, our astronauts have passed the Karman line at about 328,000 feet, continuing their ascent. First prep, status check. Astronaut Oliver. First you in flight on New Shepard. So far, a nominal flight. Our booster is about to return to its landing pad. Engine relight, the sonic boom, and booster touchdown. Welcome back, New Shepard. A beautiful rocket that provided a beautiful flight to space. First up, your booster has landed. Booster landed, landed. Blue control base on the screen. You hear about the booster. You have a very happy crew up here. I want you to know. Stand by drogues. Stand by drogues. Stand by main. Stand by main. Oh, so far, a nominal flight. Here comes the crew capsule back from space. The drogues deployed. Here are the mains out. Reefing and coming to full inflation. Our rocket went over Mach 3, and now they're coming floating back down at just about 15 or 16 miles an hour, about to join us home back here in West Texas after having gone over the Carbon Line, the internationally recognized line of space. Just got about a minute and a half of floating before uh, the activation of the skirt jet for a soft touchdown. At this point, um, there are sensors on board that are detected how high they are above the ground, multiple sensors. And just six feet above the ground, that, that cushion of air will, will puff and they will have a soft touchdown, almost like just sitting in a chair. But I'm sure their adrenaline is pumping. <laughs> and touchdown. Welcome back, New Shepherd's first human crew. What a Welcome flight. Welcome back to Earth, first step. Congratulations to all of you. What a day, what a day. First up, Blue Control, your apogee was 351,210 feet. This is space time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study has confirmed that a single dose of either the Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccine is less effective against the Delta strain of COVID-19 than the Alpha variant that previously dominated infections. The new findings, reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, show that two doses of either types of vaccine are far more effective than just a single jab when it comes to the Delta variant. The authors say the data supports efforts to maximise vaccine uptake with two doses among vulnerable populations. The scientists found the effectiveness of one dose of either Pfizer or AstraZeneca vaccines was only around 30% among persons with the Delta variant, compared to 48% among those with the Alpha strain. But after two doses, there was only a modest difference in vaccine effectiveness against the Delta variant compared to the Alpha variant. The Delta variant is twice as infectious as other COVID-19 strains. And despite claims to the contrary, those infected with the Delta variant are twice as likely to end up in hospital. 
The World Health Organization estimates over 8 million people have been killed by the COVID-19 coronavirus, with over 4.15 million confirmed fatalities and some 193 million people infected since the deadly disease first spread out of Wuhan, China. It's now been confirmed that Beijing was behind the Hafnia Microsoft Exchange Mail Service cyber attack in January. The United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, Canada, the European Union, New Zealand, Japan and NATO have all issued statements condemning China for the Hafnium attacks, which gave Beijing access to vast troves of valuable data and intellectual property. The hack by Chinese state security targeted more than 30,000 federal and state government departments, as well as local councils, IT and media sectors and businesses. Even healthcare and social and community service providers were victims of the attack. There are now growing calls around the world for Beijing to suffer consequences in order to force changes in the Chinese government's criminal behaviour. The latest revelation comes as the Chinese Communist Party has released a new video warning that Beijing will destroy Japan with a thermonuclear weapons bombardment if Tokyo attempts to defend Taiwan from a Chinese invasion. The warning came as China continues its preparations for war, with analysts now expecting the PLA to undertake a full-scale invasion of Taiwan, what Beijing would call reunification, sometime within the next six years. Beijing currently has two People's Liberation Army spy ships in international waters off the coast of Queensland, monitoring the joint Australian-US Talisman Sabre military exercises. Britain, Canada, Japan, South Korea and New Zealand will also be taking part in parts of the exercises, with France, Germany, India and Indonesia invited as observers. Scientists have found that a promising new genetic test for glaucoma has the ability to identify 15 times more people at high risk of glaucoma than existing tests. Glaucoma is one of the world's leading causes of blindness in people over the age of 60. It's actually a group of eye conditions that damage the optic nerve. This damage is often caused by abnormally high pressure in the eye. The study, reported in the Journal of the American Medical Association, builds on a long-running international collaboration between Flinders University and the QIMR Berghofer Medical Research Institute, working to identify genetic risk factors for glaucoma. A swarm of more than 140 earthquakes have rattled Yellowstone National Park, the site of one of the world's biggest supervolcanoes. The U.S. Geological Survey says the earthquake swarm was centred beneath Yellowstone Lake. They've included 40 earthquakes bigger than magnitude 2 and 2 above magnitude 3. A similar trembler group happened at the same place during December 2020. And while the USGS says there's nothing to worry about, the fear is that these tremblers could be a sign that the Yellowstone supervolcano is starting to wake up. A Yellowstone supervolcanic eruption would have global consequences, with a global climate change affecting the planet for years to decades. States surrounding Yellowstone, such as Montana, Idaho and Wyoming, would be flooded by pyroclastic flows, while other places across the United States and parts of Canada would be impacted by falling ash. The good news is the USGS says they're not expecting Yellowstone to erupt for thousands of years. And the alert level at the Yellowstone Volcanic Observatory remains green, which is normal. The service says earthquakes at Yellowstone typically happen in swarms and are caused by water getting into faults in the Earth's crust. The scientific method involves making an observation, coming up with a hypothesis to explain it, and then undertaking experiments to test your hypothesis to see if it stands up. If your experiment demonstrates your hypothesis correctly explains your observations, then you can be assured that your fellow scientists will try to find fault with it, reviewing your data to see what you may have missed. This is the scientific method. And a new book claims its adversarial nature is partly to blame for the continued existence of pseudoscience. Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptic says pseudoscience is here to stay because making stuff up is easier than letting facts get in the way. Yeah, we always think pseudoscience was around and has been around even before there was science, really. But uh, some people are trying to find out why pseudoscience is so prevalent. This is an interesting alternative to 
what most people would uh, respond and what I've often responded myself to say that pseudoscience is around because it's easier to spread these days with the internet and social media and all that sort of stuff whereas once upon a time if you wanted to spread pseudoscience you had to go down to the local park and stand on a, on a, on a stool and sort of espouse it or you had to publish something which was a bit slow to spread the information. Now you can do it on social media and do it within milliseconds. But there's a study or, or at least it's a, it's a suggestion, a theory that's come out from one particular author in a book called On the Fringe which says is that science itself, in the way science operates, is a cause of pseudoscience, or at least encourages people to believe pseudoscience, mainly because scientists disagree with each other. And as people who can tell you about science, that's the way science works. You actually disagree and you refine and refine your ideas. But in the meantime, you do get science disagreeing and suggesting that the other person's wrong, etc. And to some people, according to the author of this book, that would encourage them to say, well, scientists don't know and scientists are wrong, therefore I'll believe this person who says it's the hundred accurate and yeah, that's, um, that's what the people who promoted tobacco use and the people who promote carbon use now say. Yeah, well, there were also suggestions that it was more than just scientists disagreeing. It was scientists who were in the pay of certain organisations to actually make these statements. But certainly that created a sense of doubt that you know, some scientists were saying smoking is bad for you, some scientists, for whatever reason, were saying it's not that bad for you, and the same for climate change and all these sort of other areas, that that disagreement sort of puts people off and say, oh, well, you know, scientists can't agree. And pseudo-doctor Bill Bloggs down the road says, I have this cure for cancer it's 100 percent effective and say well you know he's certain scientists aren't so therefore i'll follow the person who's certain leaving aside the fact that scientists being uncertain is a good thing because it encourages further development and further research until you refine and refine and refine your ideas bill blogs down the road with his 100 percent cancer is never going to do any research he's never going to sort of do any sort of think close thinking about what he's saying but that's that's why people feel some sort of faith because he seems to be certain so saying that not just the way pseudoscience spreads but actually the environment in which it spreads and that scientists can be their own worst enemies. That's Tim Mendham from Australian Skeptics. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favourite podcast download provider and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 